We are pleased to have Professor Łukasz Turski as our speaker today. Of course, he is outstanding science popularizer, uh, authors of dozens of scientific publications, but I guess hundreds of articles about science. He's regularly invited to, to radio, to television programs. Uh, he's also known uh, as initiator of the Science Picnic and Copernicus Science Center. He's chairman of the uh, Copernicus Science Center Program Council since the first term. In 2000, he received the European Physical Society Medal for Dissemination of Physics. He's also awarded with the Steinhaus Award. Uh, he supervised many professors. And he is also known from his enthusiasm for the spin models, especially the Ising model. So I think this would be about these models. We can learn about these models today. So Professor, the screen is yours. The reading uh, a recent book about the shaping psychology by Tomasz Witkowski, I found the interesting question asked by him to Noam Chomsky. And uh, uh, that is a question uh, on the multiple occasions you have postulated a Galilean style of inquiry. And that was the Chomsky answer. I was quoting physicist Steven Weinberg, who described and advocated the Galilean style, whereby nature is investigated by making abstract model, the investigation of whose properties illuminate the structure of a real world. That's a sensible approach to inquire and generally, generally, I think. This is a quotation from Steven Weiberg text, uh, The Forces of Nature, published in 1977 in Science, American Scientist. So this afternoon, I take you for a short trip uh, through a particularly chosen uh, path through the models used to uh, illuminated one of probably first quantum phenomena observed uh, by a humankind, namely the magnetism. The, uh, uh, what, you, what you see here is a picture of a horse, uh, which was discovered in the Lesac cave close to Nice in the 40s. And that is a, a painting of a horse. And this brownish color is a varnish rather than the paint made with the iron oxide. And uh, this iron uh, oxide varnish is magnetically active. So this is probably the first uh, we know uh, example of the, so to say, use of a magnetism by the humans, but uh, uh, that was uh, the, the magnetic effect, which was referred as a lodestone in the previous times, was also known to uh, ancient Greeks. The first written information about the lodestone comes from the sixth century before our era, and it's attributed to the uh, Palace of Milet. And what I am showing here is a, a poem by the Roman uh, poet Lucretius Carus, which is so impressive. Uh, it's, of course, English translation uh, that uh, Daniel Matisse found it proper to use in his uh, kind of a Bible on a theory of a con contemporary theory of the, uh, of the magnetism. Now sign my muse for its weighty cause explain the magnet why it strongly draws. And then it comes the next line, which is important for my lecture. They have often seen small rings of ion six or eight or 10 compose a subtile chain. Uh, that is uh, why I'm going to talk about uh, magnetic chains uh, uh, today. And sure, the history, our understanding of the magnets have uh, uh, by the way, the word magnetism comes out from a little Greek town, Magnesia, which, is, which was in what is now Turkish Anatolia. And um, the history of the understanding of magnets was, is full of important events. 
And I'm not going to talk about, for example, about the William Gilbert, the court physician of Queen Elizabeth, who explained to us why the magnetic needle in the Busolas point out uh, always in the proper geographic direction. And we will jump already to the end of the 19th century. And in the 1895, a Pierre Curie had made, um, had proposed a purely phenomenological theory explaining how the magnetization of a given material depends on the temperature and also depends on the applied magnetic field. And uh, 10 years later, a student, a friend of uh, Pierre Curie, Paul Langevin, uh, developed a first theory of a para and diamagnetism. This is important because already at that time, uh, the, our understanding of the internal structure of the matter was uh, already uh, sufficiently developed. And the people thought that uh, the matter is built of the uh, atoms and then there are the electric charges which are moving within those atoms. And the Langevin had thought that the electrons move in, in a way in a circle and sure this current uh, uh, loop has its internal magnetic moment. So he, in, he considered a case when the matter consists of the many little uh, magnetic moments which can be aligned when external magnetic field is applied. And he had formula which these magnetic moments are interacting only with the magnetic field. And then he was able to formulate the first theory of a param and diamagnetis. And a year later, a vice had uh, proposed uh, what is now called the molecular field or the mean field theory of a ferromagnetism. And that is a very brilliant uh, use of the concept of the uh, interaction of the magnetic moments with external magnetic field, which had allowed him to, uh, in a semi phenomenological way, describe what is the ferromagnetism. But uh, then the physics was developing, and um, we will now jump not the thousands of years, but just 20 years or so. And we will come to the history of a easing model, which uh, Professor Pawlowski has already had already mentioned. And uh, this easing model is, uh, of course, a model uh, associated with the Ernest Easing. This is a picture of Ernest Easing and the title of his paper. Ernest Easing was a German physicist who uh, uh, had uh, joined Lenz in Hamburg in the 20s to write his PhD thesis. And Lenz suggested to him to use the statistical mechanics to describe a properties of this uh, magnetic moments, which have been uh, taught about by Langevin, but ignoring the origin, assuming that there are just these magnetic moments, and Ising had uh, made uh, the following assumptions to uh, build the theory of those moments. He assumed that in spite of being able to assume arbitrary direction in the space, those magnetic moments can only point in two direction with respect to the uh, applied, if there, will, uh, if there will be a magnetic field along that field and anti-parallel to it. And in addition, he made uh, the following, uh, in some sense, pro in a kind of a prophetic way, assumption that these magnetic moments interact with each other by a short range, essentially constant interaction. This is contrast to what we know from electrodynamics because the magnetic field created by the magnetic moment is a dipolar long range or field. 
So therefore, two magnetic moments interact with the dipolar forces, which are rather long range. And the assumption by uh, Ising was that this is a short range interaction. And using this, he was anyway unable to calculate anything about that model in three dimension, in the real dimensionality of the matter. So he simplified everything to the one dimension. And that was, he was able to solve. And uh, well, nothing very dramatic had happened. There was no transition from to ferromagnet. The, these moments in the one dimension, they never order in the sense we know in a ferromagnet. What Ising had discovered is that if the temperature approaches the absolute zero, there is a, some slightly unusual behavior of a magnetization of that system, uh, but he didn't pay attention to this. And now we know that this was a precursor of uh, if that was, uh, that the same phenomena happens even in a three dimension model when we approach the critical temperature, that is a temperature in which the system orders from above. Uh, so in some sense, the zero degrees Kelvin serves the, as a critical temperature in this uh, model, but we cannot just cross that, that line. Ising uh, had published his uh, PhD thesis and left physics for 20 years or so. He went first to business and then he becomes an extremely successful high school teacher. But uh, in the meantime, the Nazi Germany, Nazis have taken lead of the German politics. And uh, since Ising was a Jew, he was expelled from teaching profession and he became a headmaster of the uh, school for Jews kid, which were kid out from the normal education system. And the school was located in the, uh, at that time, a suburb of Berlin a uh, part of Berlin, which is called Kaput, and was located next to the summer cottage, which was owned by uh, Albert Einstein. The school was so poor that it didn't provide the proper uh, sanitary facilities even for the headmaster. So uh, easings were taking the everyday bath, as it is explained by easing, in the, uh, in the Einstein house. They were very friendly. Uh, in the 30, 39 or 38 rather, the school was finally closed and Ising uh, escaped to Luxembourg. And when the Luxembourg was occupied, Ising was um, uh, arrested and spent the whole time of a second war as a uh, Slave laborer in uh, in Luxembourg concentration in, in the German concentration camp in the in the Luxembourg. He was dismantling Maginot Line, and right after the war, he emigrated to the United States and become a professor at the small local university in Illinois, Bradley University. And when he arrived there in forty eight of 49, he learned that his model is uh, a mention in the titles of hundreds of papers per year. The average over a long period of time, numbers of papers in which the word Ising model is used in the title, not in the reference, but in the title of a paper is of the order of 800. And Ising was a professor at that university, become extremely uh, famous for his experiments he has performed for students, and he never ever had written a research paper. So the Ising, Ernest Ising is the author of a one research paper, which forever will be in the history of uh, physics. Uh, so it's a time to 
show you the expression what Ising model is and uh, pay attention that the symbol mu in this equation is not having any, and it didn't have any association with what we are being told in the courses of physics. Now, these were a classical magnetic moment which interact with the some kind of interaction labeled J and that interaction is non-existing in a classical physics. It is something which was invented for that model. The second term is just the interaction of a free uh, magnetic moments with the external magnetic field B. So that was the easing model, but uh, in the meantime, the, uh, this is a, a reference, if, in, in case you are interested whether the one-dimensional easing model exists in the real nature, that is the name of the compound, which is the one-dimensional easing model. And this is a reference to the rev, nice review paper on that model. Uh, the, that, the history of the easing model develops and in 44, Lars Onzager had uh, shown a solution for a two-dimensional square easing model. This is a square lattice where in each lattice site there is a, uh, there is a magnetic moment which can, which can uh, point up and down. And this, um, mo this uh, magnetic moments interact differently in the X and Y direction. What is meant that Anzager solved the model is that he was able to calculate the free energy for the, the system and show that it, there is a certain temperature, critical temperature, on which this, uh, this free energy develops a singularity and that leads to the phase transition between the disordered phase where there are no magnetization for that model to the phase where there is a macroscopic magnetization. But he didn't calculate the magnetization for the model, uh, but the mathematical method he used was a transfer matrix and the product of these two matrices forms what is now called the onzager lie algebra. Uh, in the 48, right after the war, on a conference at Cornell University, Onzager all over the sudden had silenced the conference by writing on the blackboard the explicit expression for a magnetization which he had never published before at least. And about a year later, a, a former assistant of uh, Albert Einstein, uh, Miss Broria Kaufman had published her solution of a two-dimensional Ising model, which is uh, done by uh, uh, mapping the uh, Ising model on the on the actually a free fermion operators, and uh, she provided the solution. They start working together, and uh, in uh, '49, during a conference of UPAP in Florence in Europe. Onzager said that she, he and Mrs. Kaufman have um, solved the, everything for the two-dimensional Ising model and they have the ex, explicit expression for magnetization, but he again have not shown this uh, calculation. So this is this result of the calculation. This is a magnetization and uh, 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 the critical temperature is defined by that uh, uh, equation involving uh, the hyperbolic sinus. And what, is you, what you see on the right hand side is the original plot from the, from the, from the, uh, from the Onsaker paper of the magnetization of a two dimension easing model, which clearly is finite and then it goes to zero at the critical temperature. This particular expression, which was derived by the Onzager, was finally calculated uh, four years later by C.N. Young, Frank Young, 
and he, in his memoirs, he writes that this was the longest calculation in my career. And the mystery of how Onsager got the same result remained uh, uh, a mystery until the 1990, when the Canadian physicist Stephenson made um, a public a text which bears the names of Kaufman and Onsager. And that paper end up in his hands via the chain of events. From Onsager, it went to the Elliot Montrol. Elmot Montrol gave it to the Richard Potts, who was an Australian physicist. And Stephenson was visiting Potts in Australia and got it from the Potts. And that is this uh, a, a copy of that paper. It has the name Potts because it belongs to Potts. It has the name of Bruria Kaufman and on Zagar. And you should pay attention to the title of that paper. It is Long Range Order. And this is the eight page long calculation where not only the magnetization is calculated, but also the uh, a concept of off diagonal long range order so important in the theory of superfluidity and superconductivity is introduced. It was later on published by Lars Onsager and Oliver Penrose, a brother of, of uh, the Penrose we now know and um, in Poland. And uh, that was published some years later. So this is the pictures of all those important individuals in that part of my story. Lars Zonsager, Bruria Kaufman, and uh, Frank Yang, who is the only one who is still with us from that group of individuals. But in the meantime, of course, uh, a, 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 a concept of spin in the 20s, right after the Ising model, was already uh, developed and by, Richard, by Rudolf Kronig, uh, uh, Samuel Goudsmit, and George Uhlenbeck. So in uh, 28, uh, by, by the way, uh, before we go on, I said that the easy model is permanently uh, appearing in the titles of uh, research papers. So there are just examples. Today, there is a, this is a February 21. There's a paper, Ising model as a U1 lattice gauge theory with theta terms, whatever that means. And these models are also used in biology and in the social sciences. So there is a title of a very recent paper, Social Application of Two-Dimensional Ising Model. For those of you who remember this uh, important contribution by Bibi Latante and Machi Levenstein to the uh, building up uh, models of a social, how the social groups are coming to the uh, common understanding of some phenomena, uh, the easing model is also used there as, a, as the, the starting point of the analysis. So the Ising model is forever with us in various branches of physics. And in uh, uh, the other model, which we are now going to discuss for the rest of the talk is a Heisenberg model. This is the Vernon Heisenberg. Sure, his life was clearly very different from the life of Ernst Ising. He did not suffer from the political events in Germany uh, at all. And uh, uh, this is the issue of a Zeitschrift physique uh, in which the paper of Heisenberg was published. Uh, as you see, it, it has the uh, the, the signature of Niels Bohr. So that is a copy of a, I happen to have the photograph of a copy of that uh, physics from, from Copenhagen. And this is the English translation, the Zur Theorie der Ferromagnetism, which was published in 2018 in Physik. If you can read the fine print on that uh, transparency, you see that what uh, Heisberg used in building up a model of now quantum mechanical 
spins sitting on the electrons of magnetic ions build up in the, in the lattice is based on the seminal paper of homopolar interaction by Heitler and London. Heitler and London were able to show fully quantum mechanical uh, interaction between the electrons and uh, they, they expression boiled down to a single expression complicated integral of what is now called exchange interaction between the spins of two electrons sitting on the near or on the two near sitting near each other on the lattice side atoms. This, uh, this exchange interaction shows that the idea of easing that this magnetic moments now associated with the spins of those electrons is actually uh, an interaction which is not bipolar as in a classical theory, but uh, it's just the interaction uh, given by this one integral was really uh, correct. Uh, but you will be surprised because what we are learning in a textbook as a Heisenberg model is not in that paper. The paper is written entirely using the language of a Sommerfeldian approach to quantum mechanics. The spins and the statistical properties of fermions were included in a, in a complicated way. There was no concept of a spin operators in that paper at all. So the Heisenberg model, which is that given by that simple Hamiltonian, where we have uh, spin operators sitting on two sides of a lattice interacting by the exchange interaction, was actually written by a Paul Dirac in a paper published, sorry, in a paper published uh, published in a year later. And uh, that model should actually be called a Dirac model rather than the Heisenberg model. So from now on, I will be talking about the Heisenberg model and uh, I will actually even simplify it more by talking only about a uh, one dimension uh, uh, Heisenberg model. Namely, I will put those spins on a one dimension line. If I do this, then uh, this is a picture. I will even go further and simplify by assuming that the interaction is on the nearest neighbor, that they are only sitting next to each other. And in that case, there are two models which are worth to be analyzed. The one is when this interaction is simply independent on the lattice position, namely that the interaction is just uh, between, the, uh, between the ions sitting next to each other and its constant number. And the other one is that the lattice on which the uh, spin sits is not lifeless, it is actually vibrating as any crystal, and therefore the magnetically active ions are closer and further away from each other. So in the one dimension, I can visualize that as these uh, spins being connected also by uh, springs. And uh, that means that the exchange integral depends on the displacement of the ions, magnetic ions from the equilibrium positions. But uh, if these displacements are, which are called the magnetostrictions, are not uh, actually uh, very strong, if they are very weak, then this can be linearized. And in that case, there is a, a mathematical trick which allows me to decouple the elastic degrees of freedom from magnetic degrees of freedom, which we use with Marek Cheplak years ago to prove that this one dimensional elastic magnetic moment is uh, Heisenberg model is actually completely integrable 
in the language of nonlinear uh, dynamics. The other approximation I will do is that those magnetic up spin operators S are a classical spins. Uh, uh, these are just the angular momentum operators, sit, uh, variables sitting in the lattice points. And uh, when I do this, uh, I can replace the commutators of the spin operators, but the Poisson brackets of the spins sitting on different lattice, which is given by that simple expression. The epsilon are the Levi Civita completely anti symmetric systems. So when I do this, then I can find out a remarkable property that if the Hamiltonian for the Ising, for the Heisenberg model or its generalization will be a given as the function of a spins only, then the, for the arbitrary Hamiltonian of that property, the length of the spin is conserved. So in the language of dynamics, the phase space of the system is foliated into the hypersurface corresponding to the square of the length of the spin and the length of the spin becomes the Casimir of the nonlinear dynamics of those systems. Okay, I will then do another crucial uh, step in my analysis. I will assume that this model is continuous. So I will go on into from a discrete spin models to the field theoretical models. And uh, if I do this, the simple expansion, Taylor expansion and, and partial differentiation uh, gives the following expression. The Heisberg Hamiltonian becomes a one dimensional integral along the line, uh, the length along my chain is labeled S. And this is a square of the derivative of a spin operator, which has a, and that what sits under the integral is just the energy density for the magnetic systems. I can uh, write then the equation of motion for Heisenberg model. And that equation of motion looks like this. A proper comment here is that the Heisenberg model has its own dynamics. The easing model, which you can easily infer from the Heisenberg model by writing the scalar product as a x, y, x, x times x, 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 y times x, y, and s, z times s, z, and dropping out the two terms you find out that it doesn't have any internal dynamics. And if you want to have a dynamical easing model, then we have to put up a dynamics of the spins from somewhere else. And this is done in the various ways in statistical physics. The one model is a Glauber model. The other is a Kawasaki model. And there are many other suggestions how to cook up the dynamics for the easing model. But the for Heisenberg model, we do not need to do anything. The, the Poisson brackets provide us with the proper dynamics of the model. And that is a nonlinear equation of motion for the Heisenberg continuous model, which is here. And by a proper rescaling of a time, I can write that equation uh, taking into account the fact that square of S is equal to one, I, I, I can just, just renormalize the spin as being one. And then my equation can be written in the following way, where the capital T is a spin, and I will refer to it as a spin. And let's now do the, as a kind of a leap forward by making the following observation. Uh, because the square, the length of the spin is conserved, then this vector t uh, is a unit vector. And let me 
consider the distance along the chain of these spins, magnetic spins, as a length of a curve in the fictitious three-dimensional world where the, I have a line and the vector t is a tangent vector to that line. We know from differential geometry that such a construction is described by a Frenet triad. The curve, the, the, the line is described uniquely by three vectors, a tangent, normal, and binormal vector. And these three vectors are related to each other by the Frenet-Segre equations, which I had written in a simple matrix form. And we clearly see that the curve in that description is parameterized by two degrees of freedom, so to say, a torsion tau and a curvature kappa. And now, because a, a, a length of a spin in the Heisenberg model is conserved, actually a spin in a Heisenberg model, model has only two independent components. So we have either a possibility to attempt to solve that equation of motion for spins, for example, using a, a, a spherical coordinate system, a, using a trigonometric representation of a spin, which is moving over the uh, a sphere, which with the permission of my dear friends working on the quantum information theory, if I can call a Bloch sphere, so they are moving on that sphere, uh, or I can possibly use the two numbers, kappa and tau, to parameterize my spins. And let's see what happens if instead of this complicated trigonometrical expression, I will just use those kappa and tau. If I will do this, then I have to pay also attention to the fact that the curvature and torsion depend also on time. So if I will now use uh, this equation, I can also find out that there is a third very important vector, in, or, or, or a rather fourth vector in this business, which is called the Darbu vector, which is a linear combination of a tangent and binormal vector. And this is the local axis over which the Frenet triad is rotating when the point is moving over that fictitious curve in three dimension space. So having this, observing that the length of the Darbo vector is very simple, I can, uh, uh, I can uh, look at the solutions of that equation for example, looking at the, the running wave solutions. And if I look at the running wave solutions, I can easily find, well, easily, I can find an exact solution for that, which is written here explicitly. The curvature is equal to the velocity of that running wave, and the kappa is parameterized by a certain angle. And that angle is a is an angle between the Darbu vector, which is a constant of motion for this kind of a solution, and the spin vector. So the that solution is nothing as as a wave with the frequency proportion to the cosine of theta. And uh, if you look on, from a top of the chain, you easily see that this is a wave. And that is nothing else than the finite amplitude spin wave. So the running wave solution of the Heisenberg continuous model is a finite amplitude spin wave. And in the three-dimensional world, we can only have a small amplitude spin waves. In the one dimension, we have the arbitrary uh, dimension, uh, size, uh, length uh, spin waves. So uh, these spin waves exhibit an unusual property 
namely they are unstable with respect to the perturbations and that instability is uh, having even its name uh, which I borrowed from the hydrodynamics and it's called the Benjamin Fair instability and we will see in a moment why that is the proper way. Uh, I can rewrite the equations of motion now of a Heisenberg chain by two ordinary differential equation uh, with the vector products. Uh, one is derivative. Uh, if I, instead of writing T and B, will write just the, the wrappers, the three-dimensional wrapper, which is moving on the line. And the D is a Darboux vector and the vector F contains a derivatives of a second derivative of a curvature and the first derivative of a curvature. Because a mixed derivatives must be equal, then uh, there is no, uh, not very difficult to find out that the curvature and torsion uh, obeys the following equation of motion. They look pretty strange, but if I will introduce a complex function psi, which I would like to call a wave function for some reason, uh, if I introduce this complex function, then the equation for kappa and tau can be combined into one equation for psi, and that equation is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So by that trick of introducing the triad description of my Heisenberg model, I have shown that I can either look up at this nonlinear equation for a vector, or I can map it on a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And that is of course the equation which is very famous nowadays because it's nothing else than the, uh, 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 that uh, one of those equations used in the, for example, in the many boson field, many boson theory or in the superfluidity and so forth. So we have a nonlinear Schrodinger equation which describes the properties of a one dimension continuous Heisenberg model. And therefore that equation is solvable. It has, for example, soliton solutions, and that is a picture of that soliton for those of you who don't remember it. So it is remarkable that by because the nonlinear Schrodinger model, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is completely integrable, the nonlinear Heisenberg model is also completely uh, integrable. Let me now just mention the properties of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, namely the integral of psi, the normalization of that wave function is conserved. And this is a chain energy conservation law. And there is another constant of motion, which is the whole Hamiltonian. And um, the other nice property is that if I identify a square of kappa with the density and the tau with the velocity, then this equation for kappa and tau can actually be written as a fluid dynamic equation. And the fluid dynamic equation is having the following Hamiltonian. And uh, if you drop, which is not allowed for a magnetic case, the interaction term, which is proportional to the square of a density and linearize the remaining part of that Hamiltonian, then you will get the Hamiltonian for the so-called Luttinger flu Lattinger fluid, which uh, we heard two weeks ago on the seminar uh, that it plays the role in the, in the many boson physics. So, uh, let me for a while make a short departure from a one dimension model and think about the three dimension quantum Heisenberg model. Finally, because we know that the 
Heisenberg model is inherently quantum. And I can use the mathematical trick by using a Schwinger boson representation for spins, namely represent the spin by a two Bose fields, A and B, in, uh, which are uh, uh, forming a spinner. And uh, the, uh, then the length of the spin is a, con is a constraint that the number of A bosons, so to say, and B bosons must be fixed. And that allow me to uh, describe the Heisenberg model in the three dimensions, purely quantum mechanically. And particularly, I can use a mean field approximation for that model using a coherent states for E and B operators. And if I eliminated the B, one of those bosons, for example, B bosons from that description in favor of A bosons, then this equation for, I can derive from the Heisenberg model an equation for the eigenvalue of this, the spin operators. And that is a field in the continuum limit. And we shall see in a moment that it is interesting equation. But I can also describe the three-dimensional uh, Heisenberg model using a concept of the spin coherent states, which are defined by the following expression. And then also go to the continuum limit and look at what is the equation of motion for the eigenvalue of those spin operators mu. And in both of those cases, a mean field approximation turns out to be nonlinear Schrodinger equation, exactly that in the one dimension case. So the mean field description of a three dimensional continuous Heisenberg chain is governed the dynamics of in the mean field theory of the Heisenberg model in the three dimension turns out to be uh, the same equation which describe exactly the dynamics of a one dimension continuous classical model. I think that this is an interesting observation. But in a physics, the models are usually dissipative. The model usually uh, lose the energy and uh, uh, Lev Landau had suggested the following equation of motion uh, for the damped uh, Landau uh, Heisenberg model. You can see that this is the nonlinear uh, undamped, the real Heisenberg model in the blue letters. And the generalization for a dissipation, which was proposed by Landau, is the red equation. It describes the motion of a spin on a sphere, which is uh, losing the energy, but it stays on the sphere. So it preserves the length of the spin. Uh, I said at the beginning that the, the, the space, the phase space for the spins is foliated in those hypersurface of a constant magnetic field, uh, constant uh, uh, length of the spin. And uh, the Landau damping describes the damping of a motion within one of those leaves. But of course, we will be in the physics interested also in the transition between the different leaves when the dissipative, when the length of the magnetization is also decreases. And uh, that will be another coefficient necessary in addition to this coefficient of a damping lambda in the Landau equation. And these addition coefficient and lambda together are nothing else than the longitudinal and transverse relaxation times, which are used, for example, in Bloch theory of the nuclear magnetic resonance. But that's the other issue. 
So if uh, I have that equation, then uh, uh, I can show that uh, going over this triads business, that the equation of motion for a one dimensional continuous damped Landau uh, Heisenberg model is governed by the following equation. And then this similarity to the three dimension is already broken because the last term in that expression contains the integral of the current, energy current in the one dimension, which surely enough cannot be generalized to the three dimensions because we cannot add the scalar to the vector. So uh, this, this analogy is, uh, is, uh, is broken. But uh, uh, I skip that. And let me immediately write this. The uh, undumped Heisenberg model can be written also as the as simple with the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian and the uh, damped equation is uh, written below. And it is interesting that uh, in a theory of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, there is also a possibility of building up another damped equation, which is the uh, uh, which is uh, the equation which conserved the normalization of the wave function that is uh, conserved the, the uh, energy, but it dumps the angles. And uh, that is the equation which uh, Professor Pawlowski and I, we use in the paper on the damped boson system, but uh, I will have no time to discuss it any, any further. Uh, so let me now, uh, coming slowly to the end of the story, uh, take you for a science fiction part of my story. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, two French brothers, Francois and Eugene Cosserat, have suggested a generalization of a ordinary elasticity theory. Elasticity theory was very well developed in the 19th century uh, because people have to build up the dams, buildings, and uh, generally they were, ex they were enormously successful engineers at the time. They had to know how to, uh, how to calculate without the computers, what is impressive, uh, for example, the properties of this incredible bridge built up by the uh, Eiffel in, in, in French Alps. And uh, uh, even the construction of the Eiffel Tower require incredible understanding on a elasticity theory and uh, 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 the properties of a material in the 19th century, which was incredible if you think that they didn't have all our today's machinery at their disposal. So what Kassara brothers have done, they said, well, but the elasticity, which this is a one slide course in the classical elasticity, is, uh, is very simple. It only refers to the translation degrees of freedom of the, of the materials. Uh, and indeed, this is the fact that if I have the ma elastic material, this is the left side of this uh, yellow picture, and I draw my coordinate system in it, if I deform it, that coordinate system is, of course, frozen in the medium, so it deform itself. Therefore, the metrics of the undeformed and deformed uh, uh, material is different and its difference, which is in, the, in this uh, square uh, box, is called the, the, the deformation tensor. And because the thing is in a three dimension, then uh, the, the space is flat. So the Riemann tensor uh, as a function of this deformed matrix must be equal to zero and this is what is in called 
in today's language is what elasticity theory people call a sound noun equations. And those equations in three dimensions uh, allow us to parameterize the deformation by a derivatives of a, what is called the displacement vector. So this is a purely translation degrees of freedom theory. And the brother Cosera asks, what happens if, the, if it, there are additional properties of this matter, if there are local rotation? So when we deform the medium, the something, the rotation degrees of freedom within the medium are also involved. Or what happens if this parameter, this matter is not perfect? And uh, in the middle of the last century, the theory of this, what happens when the material is not on the translation, but for example, it has defects in it. So this nice description uh, of by displacement degrees of freedom is impossible. And uh, there are some publications about it, but uh, the, I would like to show the copy of the uh, book written by my late dear friend from uh, Institute of Fundamental Technological Research in Warsaw, Marek Żuraski, who had written a book on the theory mathematique de dislocation. It was published by Andrei Lichnerowicz. And let me briefly tell you what are the dislocations. Uh, look at the left. This is a perfect square lattice. And suppose you have purchased an additional atomic plane which you force from a top into the lattice. So below a certain line and above it, the lattice is perfect, but there is a region where the circuit with four steps cannot be closed. The loop, the loop this red loop is not closed. You have to fill it by adding additional vector. And that vector is called the Burgers vector. And the same thing happens, and that is a phenomena in the matter which is called the edge dislocation. And to the right, you have a screw dislocation, which is the same distortion of a lattice when the local lattice look like a ramp in a parking garage where you go around a certain line, and that line is actually a dislocation line. And uh, these materials are described in a, in a way uh, by a gauge theorem. Uh, we have luckily a perfect triad of vectors. For example, these bluish vectors, which I have shown here. But when the lattice is distorted, the external coordinate system, the X eyes, is no longer related to a bluish line like in the elasticity theory by displacement vector, but the relation is infinitesimal. And the, therefore, I, the distorted material is having a matrix which is related to the undistorted matrix by these coefficients, which are called B. They look pretty much uh, abstract, but with them I can construct not only the matrix, but also the affine connection. And that affine connection is a teleparallel connection. Its Riemann tensor is automatically equal to zero. So now let counts. We have a three dimensional world. So we have a nine components of the gamma. And since the Riemann tensor has in three dimensions, six independent components, then therefore by the sum Venan condition or the fact that the Riemann tensor is equal to zero, I have only three independent components of the gammas. And uh, 
but I have no uh, rule that the gammas are symmetric in the lower indices. And what has been shown in those publications on the dislocation theory, the eighth and symmetric part of the affine connection, the torsion of the space is actually a density of those dislocation lines. So now let me do the science fiction part of my lecture. Let me imagine that I have a medium in which I have my distortions B and let me make an assumption that the geodesic line in those medium given by the following formula are actually those lines this, which correspond to the one dimension continuous Heisenberg chain. Then the torsion and the curvature of those lines are a part of the gammas. So I'm having just a one free parameter or, an, or a component of a fine connection, but two of them are fixed by the magnetic property of the chain. And if I do what the people in this location theory do, which is a, a, called the Krenner approximation, uh, that is that I assume that these distortions are only slightly different than the in a classical elasticity theory, that is that this contribution of those defects is not really too much, so this can be linearized, then the curvature, then I can calculate the distortion of that medium and relate them to the magnetic properties of the Heisenberg chain. So theoretically, I can go to the lab and try to cook up a, a three-dimensional medium which has a property of a one-dimensional magnetic moment. Whether this freedom uh, that I can choose one component of gamma, so one component of beta uh, will, is, uh, is, is, will make it impossible to construct the medium. I don't think it's correct because if I can think about the two dimension uh, medium, which is homogeneous in the say Z direction, then the gamma on actually has only two components and those are given by the kappa and torsion. So whether this has any uh, real uh, physical application that I'm not sure, but that is, I think uh, following the line of the, that Chomsky and Weinberg theory that we should try to use the, this abstract model, which helped us the, understand the properties of matter to push us, to push us forward in the path of understanding uh, a little better of what can happen in a real nature. The last application, which I will only show is uh, tendril and uh, the biological experts are interested in what ha happens, why the tendrils form this complicated structures. This is, by the way, a picture, original drawing of Charles Darwin. And uh, the theory of the growing tendrils is written, for example, by John Maddox in a nice paper on bifurcation theory, symmetry breaking, and homogenization in continuum mechanics description of DNA. And those equations for these vectors D1, D2, and D3 along the tendril obey the same kind of equations as for the one dimension Heisenberg model. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, but the, the matrices are slightly different. And sure enough, now the motion means the growth 
of that object. So these models are uh, complicated because in, in addition to the time and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the length along this, uh, in this tendril, there, are, there is an, an addition thing uh, which is the coupling of that to the external world, which is which is hidden into the expression for U and D. But anyway, it's very very similar model. So the Heisenberg model, similar as Ising model, plays also the role in the in in the biology. So with this, I would like to end showing you the 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 the, uh, the picture of all the heroes of my today lecture in a proper order. Ernest Ising, Lars Onsager, Buria Kaufman, Frank Young, and Werner Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, and Lev Landau. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. And uh, we're running out of time, but still there is time for, let's say, one question. Quick question, then we stop recording and then we can continue eventually in the informal discussion. May I have a tiny remark? Yes. You've mentioned applications of easing model to, to social problems and events. And to for, for me, the earliest uh, reference to it would be that to Weidlich's application of easing model uh, that I heard of directly from Weidlich in mid 60s when i was still a young student yes. yes i agree i agree i should have done it i i i i re i am fully that is a very very proper comment i uh, i apologize i should have uh, i didn't have the 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 picture of the of the paper of widely so i couldn't show it as a survey but sure enough yes this is a very Holgan Weidli, who is unfortunately also not with us. And uh, I agree that, this, that that was the first use. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so thank you again for this interesting and deep talk.